Good morning, everybody. Let's get ready for day two of the California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference. Look at the troopers that have made it here for um, the early morning session of uh, launching day two of the California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference. So I'm excited, and um, uh, I hope you are too. We've got uh, a, a whole slew of other speakers today, and um, uh, speakers, presenters, people offering unique ideas about um, innovative teaching, pedagogy, research, um, uh, to help advance your careers and to help you impact students in your own universities. So I hope you found a lot of tools, concepts, techniques, ideas from yesterday's sessions, and I'm sure we'll do more of the same today. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, it's um, uh, putting on a conference like this takes, takes a village, if you will. Uh, it takes um, uh, a lot of time, energy, and effort, and um, also it requires support for us to be able to keep our registration fees where we are. It requires these organizations that believe in what we're doing in the California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference. So um, uh, I want to thank... Um, uh, a number of different units at, at San Diego State University, the Fowler College of Business, the Wendy Gillespie Center for Advancing Global Studies, the, um, 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 which, oh well, yeah, our Mission Valley Innovation District. Uh, so San Diego State has really supported this in a lot of great ways. But um, USC Marshall, uh, my good friend Patrick, uh, Snyder at BizStarts, um, my friends at Fresno State, Emil back there, thank you for my Fresno State connections. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, Mark Monahan, you here from Cal State San Marcos, thank you for your support. And uh, Cal State East Bay, uh, all right, the East Bay contingents here, thank you so much. Um, Setis University, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Always love having set these here and supporting. And, and uh, uh, Julianne Shields was here yesterday from USASBI. She had to take off this morning. And a very special sponsor, uh, a former student of ours who ran this conference for us as a student. And um, now she is a professional event planner. And she said, I want to be part of sponsoring the California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference, Tammy Nguyen. <laughs> uh, special thank you. It's always fantastic when a student comes back and now is a sponsor and a supporter. Thank you, Tammy. All right, to uh, kick off day two, I want to introduce you. Uh, most of you, uh, mo I think this whole audience does not need an introduction to uh, my, my good friend, this is Dr. Michael Morris. Michael and I started our doctoral studies together back in 1978, 77, somewhere along those lines. <laughs> and uh, as doctoral students at Virginia Tech, um, uh, we really pushed each other. And, and um, uh, what has been a real pleasure for me is as I've gone on in my career and uh, really established my career at this, my home university, uh, I've watched Michael do amazing things uh, in the field of entrepreneurship. He is passionate, as many of you know. Um, he has uh, authored multiple books, uh, uh, just a litany of research articles. Um, he is really helped define the field of corporate entrepreneurship um, um, uh, among many other areas of entrepreneurial uh, identity, and um, uh, the, the, the list goes on. But in more recent years, Michael has devoted his professional um, talents, skills, knowledge, networking abilities to 
um, do something that is extremely passionate and extremely impactful. And so I've asked Michael to put together a special talk today, uh, a talk about um, his own career and how he's using what we teach every day in the field of entrepreneurship, what we, what we embody every day um, to make positive impacts in communities around the world. Uh, Michael, your work is nothing short of extraordinary and impactful at a global level. It's my honor to introduce to you my longtime friend, pal and companion, Dr. Michael Morris. Good morning. So I, I, I was trying to do the math with Alex there. He, he, <laughs> I actually started my doctoral program and I, I thought it was 79. I think he started in 77 and we finished at the same time as it. <laughs> so I um, usually, at things like this, I'm giving research presentations. But because uh, this is uh, a momentous occasion with regard to Alex. Um, none of us really, really believe he's retiring, but, <laughs> but because he's going to pretend to retire, um, I, I, I decided to try to put something different together uh, in his honor. And this is, uh, uh, I, I don't really, I expect many of you are the same way, just don't really like talking about myself. Um, but <clears throat> I wanted to, and this is not gonna be some maudlin thing, so don't get too worried. Uh, but I, I uh, put together some comments today, this morning, uh, reflecting on my career. And I think Alex, some of the other people who know me well, is, is uh, it's been a career uh, that is parallel. We finished the doctoral program at the same time, uh, so uh, almost 40 years, um, where I've sort of, whether intentionally or unintentionally, but I think intentionally, challenged conventional wisdom and tried to do things my own way. And so the question is, is there anything to learn from that? So what I want to talk about is, is, is how you might think about your own careers a little bit differently. So I've had a productive career. And uh, thinking about some of what we've been able to accomplish over these years, um, I've been able to publish 14 books. I've been able to publish about 140 journal articles. I got to start the first ever Department of Entrepreneurship at a major research university. And back in the day, Don Kradko and I used to compete a bit, so was constantly one-upping each other. And so we created the first school of entrepreneurship at a, at a major university. And, some of these programs have gotten ranked. One got all the way to number one. Three of them got in the top 10. I've been able to create well over 25 unique courses in entrepreneurship. And when Alex and I started, if they had an entrepreneurship course, that was unusual, much less a curriculum of 30 or 40 courses. And I say that not in any way to wave my own flag. I say that because if you look at the productivity and you ask the simple question, where did that come from? How was I able to do those things? The answer is something that may surprise you. Because when you think of research faculty, what do you think of? Some woman or man who's locked up in a room up on the top floor of some building, away from the world, pontificating, whatever, theorizing, 
And for me, the answer is a very different answer. So how do each of you feed your imagination? Because we are all, at the end of the day, artists. I hope you see yourself as an artist. When you write a research paper, that's no different than a painter painting a picture. When you put a brilliant lecture together and deliver it, that's no different than an architect building an amazing building. So how do we feed our art? What fuels it? What drives it? What inspires it? And so to me, we, we, we all read scholarly articles, but we're also affected by things like the California Educators Conference, interacting with folks. You know, what, what's the sign of a great conference? For, for me, over the years, it's always been, do I get back on the plane with two ideas I didn't have when I got, when I got there? That's a great conference to me. The rest of it, the meals, the, the, all the other things that happen, secondary. Did I walk away with two ideas I never had before? Interacting and debating with colleagues, maybe at places like this, maybe in the hallway or the office at school. Sometimes the popular media. They don't get it right much, but they say things that get you thinking. <laughs> Everyday observation. You know, we, we, if you're a faculty member, you're not up on a mountain. You're, you're an observer of life. You're an observer of reality. You're watching phenomena all the time and reflecting on them. Hobbies. You know, I, I love to garden. As sadly you'll see later today, I also play the drums. <laughs> and um, those play a role in my creative process. I'm going to come back to the creative process before I'm done. Um, and, and obviously, personal reflection. Those moments. We all wish they happened more often, but those moments when, you know, there's a spark. So it is all of those things for me, but it is something more. To me, the fuel that drives the thinking and the teaching and the ideas and the innovations is, is, is the ways in which I find to connect with everyday life, not remove myself from everyday life, connect. Living the things that I write about and teach about. You really have to walk the walk, some. Induction and deduction as you travel abroad, as you get engaged in this, as you do that. But the wheel's turning. And most critically, if we do nothing else when we, when we write, when we theorize, when we do the work we do, we're taking a chaotic world and bringing order to it. So to me, this, beyond reading the scholarly works, attending the academic conferences. To me, it's about community engagement. And as you'll see in a moment, that runs against the grain. Because most people see it as a world of trade-offs. If you're engaged in community activities as a faculty member, that means you're not researching. That means you're not coming up with pedagogical innovations for your classroom. And I'm saying just the opposite. Community, engaging with companies. It, it, it is ludicrous to be in a business school or teaching a business subject and not have interaction with companies. It, it's like a, a, a chemist not having interaction with chemicals. <laughs> with entrepreneurs, with neighborhoods in your hometowns, with local ecosystems, everyday people, colleagues, and putting yourself in diverse contexts. 
We tell all our students, you got to get into your discomfort zone. Well, that sounds so weak if you're not willing to put yourself in your discomfort zone. And so when we talk about community engagement, let's look at not, not what they tell you, but the reality of what universities do. I doubt anybody in the room will tell me if in the first five years of your career, no matter how shitty your teaching evaluations are, <laughs> if you have 13 journal publications, you'll get tenure. So they may tell you here are the weights, but the reality of the weights are it's 75% minimally research. They like to say 50. It's 75% or more research. It's 24% teaching, but basically you just can't shoot anybody in your classroom. <laughs> and you better get your pronouns right. But 1% service or engagement. In my career, it's been 45% research, and I'm a pretty productive researcher. 45% research, 30% service engagement, and 25% teaching. And I've gotten some teaching awards, so I can teach. But that 25% may seem like a low number to you. It's not a low number if you realize these are not three independent boxes. If you realize there's a potential, if done right, for synergy. I don't have to spend as much time thinking about how I'm going to teach because it comes to me because of the other activities I'm engaged in. So <clears throat> how do you reorient things and yet be productive and yet come out with a fantastic record and try to make a difference? <clears throat> to me, it's about synergism and intentionality. So I do a lot of community engagement. But I'm not doing teaching and research as independent, separate products. I'm doing them at the same time. And they may be dealing with different issues, but I'm consciously aware as I'm doing community engagement of that, but of the research I'm working on, of the teaching I'm doing. And so the, the borders are porous between those three. That's not to say I take on a community engagement looking for research possibilities. I do not. I never do. You know, Don and I, uh, uh, Alex and I had a, a colleague, and he spent the early part of his career, which led to a, a, a more difficult career, doing a hell of a lot of corporate consulting. And he was doing it for the money. But he would always say, well, the, my consulting will inform my research. It never did. The, 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 the consulting was doing was on some specific management problem that didn't directly inform any research questions. So it's not like I pick community things to do because they will have. I, I, that's not, I pick community things to do only because they matter only because I believe in them. But they almost always have spillovers. It's about how you approach them. Spillovers for teaching, spillovers for research. As I'm engaging in community engagement, things emerge. And it's after the fact that I discern Oh, there's a whole different way I'm going to approach teaching this topic. There's a new story I'm going to introduce into my lectures. There's a fascinating question that I never appreciated was actually a more relevant research question than the thing I've been working on. And so I'm not looking, but I'm open. And the connections tend to emerge because of those porous boundaries. 
I believe this works based on three values. The first of those has to do with empathy. I can't overstate how important this is. You have to empathize with the entrepreneur and what she's dealing with. If she's a single mother of three, working two part-time jobs while trying to start a business, you have to walk in her shoes. You have to understand how she makes sense of the world, how she processes information. So empathy in, in terms of walking in their shoes, feeling. This is a world of feelings. We try to act objective as scholars, like there's no feelings involved. It's just ridiculous. It's all about emotion. Sense-making, but how do they make sense? How do they experience the world? Secondly, and this is a big one, humility. I love, so, so, so when I'm asking students, uh, when, when I interview students for, for jobs with our program, or when I'm interviewing students to be part of our South Africa initiative every summer, my favorite question to ask students is, <clears throat> what is the sign of an educated man or woman? What is the sign of an educated man or woman? And I'll get usually answers from students like, well, they present themselves well. Well, they communicate nicely. And I usually say, yeah, 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 that's all fine. I said, but if you were sitting at a bus stop and the man sitting next to you was clearly disheveled, dirty, torn clothing, clearly a homeless person. Could he be an educated man? Well, yes, of course he could. Well, he doesn't meet your definition. He's not presenting himself very well, not communicating very clearly. To me, the sign of an educated man or woman is it's a man or woman who knows what they don't know. Knows what they don't know. Back in the day when Alex and I were together at Virginia Tech and we finished our doctoral programs, we actually studied for comps in the sauna. <laughs> but back in the day, I will never ever forget the day I got my PhD, the day I graduated. Because you know what you go through. But it was so anticlimactic. Because I thought to myself, I know more at this moment in time than I've known at any point in my life. <laughs> and I don't know anything. <laughs> we can't pretend because we're university professors that we know it all. We probably know less because of our education. Because we start to appreciate how complicated the world really is. And so this humility in terms of escaping the bounds of your ego, of your biases, of your judgments, questioning what you know to be true, it doesn't mean it's not about your experiences. It is. It is about your observation. It is about your insights. But again, looking at your experiences through the eyes of others. And the third value that I think is critical is curiosity. Why? Why do entrepreneurs do this? Why does this outcome happen? Why are things not changing? Why do these outcomes continue to happen in this way? Why do certain events occur? Why do things work this way? If you're not curious, I'd hang it up. But, but you, you need to nurture that curiosity. You need to encourage that curiosity. Uh, 
have an entrepreneurs, a couple of entrepreneurs, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit, but it's not the focus today about our poverty program. But we have a couple of entrepreneurs who um, we work with, low income, disadvantaged entrepreneurs. And they're actually making it. Their businesses are making money. Not a lot of money, but they're making money. One lady makes chocolate. She, uh, I made the mistake one day of using the term Hershey's. <laughs> and, and, and she was insulted, because she makes artisan chocolate. And I'll tell you, her bonbons are amazing. You don't want to eat them because they look like pieces of art. They're so meticulously. Takes her three and a half days to do one production run, all by hand. And her wrist is going. She had to have some surgery. And we arranged, helped her qualify for a microloan for a $22,000 piece of equipment that would, a mi mixing machine. It was a game changer. It would take her to the next level. She would not pull the trigger. She wouldn't follow through on the loan. The loan's on the table. Wouldn't do it. Another guy who has a, is a B2B kind of model, but making T-shirts, like moving companies. I work for Johnson Moving on my T-shirt as I haul your stuff out. Same deal. That's from community engagement. When we talk about entrepreneurship, what do we talk about? Well, a big issue is fear of failure. But what do my two stories suggest? Maybe there's also a fear of success. What are the costs of success? Might my neighborhood and community abandon me because now I'm successful? Might that role challenge my identity? Might I be unprepared for that role of successful entrepreneur? There are a whole lot of costs that can be identified around success. Isn't that interesting? I, I, I didn't get that from a scholarly article. I got that from community engagement. And we've got a major paper now on fear of success and the disadvantaged entrepreneur. So <clears throat> it's about community engagement for me, and it's about how that makes me a better teacher how that makes me a more productive researcher, how it makes my research more relevant. So in thinking about community engagement for this talk, there are probably more, but I identified six key categories of community engagement, all of which I've done, I, I've been involved in. So whether that's consulting to companies, whether that's Programming in a com community, like a women's entrepreneurship symposium for the community, whether that's volunteering for issues, organizations, ecosystem activities, whatever, whether that's faculty training and development, like we do with the experiential classroom, whether that's experiential learning projects I design for the classroom, like the entrepreneurial audit, or whether that's experiential learning projects outside of class. Each of those becomes a critical source of community engagement. So let me just connect the dot, OK? I'm going to share a couple of examples of community engagement things I did and how that informed the classroom and how that informed my research. So I'll start with. Well, let me just talk a little bit about my activities. I, don't, I think this was two columns, and there's no longer two columns, so something happened here. But 
But some of the community engagement activities that I've had the fortune of being part of in, 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 in include doing a Fulbright, which happened to take place in South Africa and so became a whole pathway for a series of things that I've done over the years and in, 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 in South Africa. It led to that entrepreneurship empowerment in South Africa that this is the 23rd year that we will have run that program. I hired a faculty member when I was at Syracuse and he was looking at the cool experiential learning things we were doing, the cool community engagement things we were doing, something called uh, 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 wise or women igniting the spirit of entrepreneurship and he started talking about the challenges that disabled veterans have and so we created a, a program for disabled veterans from around the country free to the veteran but intense exposure to entrepreneurship. <clears throat> I'm going to talk more about the urban poverty and business initiative but programs working with low income and disadvantaged entrepreneurs my work in South Africa led to opportunities to consult to companies in South Africa. It's always, always interesting when some American faculty member, uh, you know, you get a certain cachet because you're from America that people think you might know what you're talking about. And so your doors open for you, but then when you step in that door, if you don't perform, there's no tolerance for that. And so that, that experience, um, uh, doing sessions like this one. Uh, so, so I've had this 40-year career that's been packed with this kind of activity. Even activity that maybe you think is mundane is not mundane. So in the early years, and, and subsequently, being the faculty advisor to a student club. That's a different form of community engagement, but, but getting that student club doing things in the community. Whether that's organizing student mentoring programs or student incubators. If you're gonna have a student incubator, that can't be some island sitting on the campus. That has to be enmeshed and integrated in the ecosystem of the community. So it's all community engagement. So as <clears throat> we've done this work, let's just take consulting as an example, working with larger firms. My work with larger firms led to a book that we went through three editions of on corporate entrepreneurship. It led to the creation of a corporate entrepreneurship course. It led to the invention of new pedagogical tools. So we de designed a mechanism whereby you can go in and do an entrepreneurial audit of a company, give it a score for how entrepreneurial it is. And that's something CEOs like to know. Have we lost our entrepreneurial edge? Have we become a, a, a bureaucratic, you know, has, has Google is, still, is Google still entrepreneurial or is it a, a, a institutionalized? So it, it has produced fascinating stories. And of course, I take license when I start to, the difference between the true story and the story I share with students might have been embellished a bit or whatever, but that's okay. <laughs> a whole research stream on corporate entrepreneurship and issues surrounding, for instance, HR practices that facilitate more entrepreneurial behavior inside of organizations. The concept of entrepreneurial intensity looking at companies which are collective places, I got curious as to what's the role of individualism in a corporate kind of context and how does that influence entrepreneurial behavior? Because entrepreneurs are individuals. And so what I'm trying to show you is by doing the community engagement, it's not separate from, it fuels my teaching, my pedagogical innovations, my research, working with entrepreneurs in general. It was ironic at the same time that Osterwalder was coming up with his business model canvas, which I don't think very much of, principally because we designed a business model framework at the exact same time, we just didn't have 
clever grade school looking graphics to go with our business model framework. And he lives in a much nicer house than I do. But, but we have a business model framework that a lot of people use. One of the big questions, the issues that's not addressed in, in most um, finance books, accounting books, is how do we capture the profit model of the entrepreneur? And that, that, that I got curious about that, working with entrepreneurs, looking at, well, what are your margins and how do they compare to your volumes? And what are the different combinations of high, medium, and low volume and high, medium, and low margin that explains a problematic versus a highly profitable kind of business? <clears throat> One of the things that I most observe just doing community engagement with entrepreneurs is it just seemed every entrepreneur I met that was highly successful and interacted with, what they created, you got to get past their you know, hubris and their ego and their uh, tendency to dress in all black. <laughs> but I was intrigued working with these entrepreneurs that what they created was almost never what they started out to create, right? But that's from the world of practice, interacting with them, working with them, assisting them, having students assist them. And so we did a study. And lo and behold, we went to Ireland. We got, we got like 60, 70 Irish companies that were five years in and hugely successful. And to participate in the study, you have to share your original business plan. So the whole purpose of the study was to compare the original business plan to the current business model. And in 100% of the cases, the current business model looked nothing like the original business plan. What's that tell you? Emergence is a core property of the entrepreneurial journey. Your markets will change, your products will change, your financial model will change, your employee type of employee you hire will change, your locations will change. And so a whole stream, I'm going to show you some of this, a stream of work that came out, but that's from working with entrepreneurs around this theme of emergence. You know, I found working with entrepreneurs that you know, we, 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 we saw this stuff in the literature about traits, traits and entrepreneurs, right? Traits, uh, entrepreneurs are calculated risk takers. Entrepreneurs have a strong internal locus of control. Entrepreneurs are more achievement motivated. Yeah, maybe. When I look past that, working with entrepreneurs at what they seem to do well, not what psychological traits they had, certain competencies started to emerge. And so we published major work on 13 critical entrepreneurial competencies, not managerial competencies, like how to manage cash flow or how to sell, entrepreneurial competencies, like how to leverage resources and how to recognize opportunity. Thirdly, <coughs> a seminal factor in my development and growth was the, the launch of uh, entrepreneurship empowerment in South Africa. This is a student program. I'm, I'm going over there in June for the 23rd time. But we take 28, this year 32 students to South Africa for six weeks every summer. We go into the shanty towns, into the townships, and they spend six weeks busting their butts, helping severely disadvantaged entrepreneurs. It's, it's an amazing program. It's been an amazing experience. And I've managed to be able to move it with me wherever I went, which is not always easy to take a program that you create at one university and take it somewhere else. But it's produced this wealth of things that affect. So this is community engagement. My teaching affect my research. The, 
we, we have something called the C model, the supporting emerging enterprises model, but it's an incredibly effective way to quickly wrap your arms around a business and capture what the, 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 the 15 priority issues are inside that business. We, we, we did some early groundbreaking work on township entrepreneurs who were in the informal sector. It was actually, you know, in the, in the bad old days, the evil days of apartheid, blacks could not, uh, they could not sell liquor. They, they, they couldn't have bars. And so, and, and of course, people are entrepreneurial. So they would run what's called a shabeen, a, a bar out of the living room of their shack. And, and uh, so we found a lot of those and did a major paper on their, you know, how they survive and how they supply themselves and how they, uh, uh, and you'll see where that led in a moment. But uh, the, the whole approach we use in our student consulting today in the class that we teach on student consulting and entrepreneurship is a, based on a process-based approach to consulting that came out of ESA. <laughs> You know, we have, we're working with entrepreneurs in South Africa where they have no data, no market data, no information on market size. You're living in a township with two million other dirt poor people living in shacks. How do you figure out market descriptors, market size, when you have no data? Well, we've got approaches to doing that that are predicated on that, that work work on, as it was obvious as we work with these businesses, how they adapt. So papers we've published on strategic adaptation. And so, we did a, 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 for many years, a program called WISE, or Women Igniting the Spirit of Entrepreneurship, that became Women Entrepreneurs uh, Inspire, and our Disabled Veterans Program. But that work supporting those entrepreneurs in the community led to questions as to why do women-owned businesses in general tend to be more lifestyle-type businesses and, and don't grow? Is it a deliberate choice? Is it tied to um, the kind of business they start? Is it tied to their gross underrepresentation historically in engineering schools or you know, science programs in universities? Well, th th that's that curiosity. and We're intrigued as we're working with these, these, these amazing entrepreneurs to find out why. And, and so that's led to creation of courses on women and minority entrepreneurship at three different universities. And, 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 and stories, you know, I, I profoundly believe in teaching, through, teaching content through stories. Well, all the stories come from community engagement. So then, a big one that goes back in time to programs we started in Oklahoma that dealt with Native American entrepreneurship, to a program I started at Syracuse that dealt with the inner city, the south side, but what's today become the Urban Poverty and Business Initiative, which is probably the thing I'm most proud of in my career, but we, we with UPBI, we work with low-income and disadvantaged entrepreneurs in the community over Ten and a half months each year, moving them through stages. So six Saturdays of training, four and a half months of mentoring from successful entrepreneurs in the community, 14 weeks of student consulting where students create websites and bookkeeping systems and social media campaigns for these entrepreneurs, and <coughs> community connection events, a pathway to micro. There are six components to this, this program. It's a, it's a cool program, and it works. It's moving people up. We're now in 28 cities across the country. A few of those cities are represented here. Our partner in Puerto Rico, our partner in, in, in San Diego. I think I saw our partner in Los Angeles. Um, so it's starting to scale. It's, it's a pretty cool kind of initiative. But this engagement working with the disadvantaged entrepreneur has produced just a ton of teaching tools. The, the whole consulting program we do, we only, students today when they do consulting with us are only working with disadvantaged entrepreneurs through 
classes are getting credit in many cases, not all cases, but the concept of the commodity trap that we publish, the concept of the opportunity horizon that we publish comes directly out of this reach, this research. Our 80 steps to a sustainable enterprise is being used not just in this program, but in other aspects of the things we do. Recent publications on organizational fragility because these, these, these businesses are highly fragile. Our, our work on the liabilities of poorness which, which uh, couple with the liabilities of newness and smallness that affect startup ventures. So, and, and even with our global partnership for poverty and entrepreneurship, which is a, a portal to share information with people around the world about what's happening at the poverty and entrepreneurship interface, this has produced an ability to map where the gaps are in the research on poverty and entrepreneurship, a webinar series. To me, Implicit in all of this is the creative process. And purposefully, intentionally building the creative process into, into your work. And each of these stages, particularly the frustration and incubation stage, but also, yeah, I see it, I got it. Also, the, the, the illumination stage, I'm, I'm providing her with some experiential <laughs> opportunity. So, 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 bring it back to research. When we look at research, for me, it's an iterative process. It's a constant back and forth kind of process. What I'm trying to say, is, you can't read that, can you? So that should, that's this development of the research questions, designing model and hypotheses, research design and measurement approach, interpretation of the findings, what, what this graph is meant to illustrate is how all this community engagement informs every step of every research paper I write. It's an iterative back and forth. Well, how does that concept or principle relate when I'm dealing with these entrepreneurs in this situation where I've had this community engagement activity? And so it makes the research question less or more relevant. It introduces new variables into the research model and into the kinds of hypotheses I pose. It affects how we sample and the kind of measurement approaches we use. It affects how we interpret results. So the community engagement is fostering the research. It's, it's, it's guiding the research. It's making the research better. <clears throat> and this again, as I don't know why these came in this is a flow model, but it didn't show up here as a flow model. Uh, I'm sorry it didn't because it loses the whole principle of the, 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 the slide. Th this is, each of these leads to the next. So I'm trying to show you a trajectory in research. And so it was a flow model of boxes, but anyway, you get the idea. But what I'm trying to say is the early work we did on the informal sector led us to recognize from community engagement how Organizations adapt. And that adaptation that's so critical, I hate the word pivot. I like the word adapt. Pivot sounds like some, some marketing concept. Entrepreneurs adapt. And, and, and that led to realizing that ventures emerge. And as we did work and published a book and, and, and wrote articles on emergence, it started to become apparent that as they emerge, some of them become survival businesses, some become lifestyle businesses, some become managed growth businesses, some become aggressive growth businesses. And so we published work on the typology of different kinds of ventures. But as we're looking at the creation of those ventures, we start to realize that the competencies for these ventures are different than the competencies for those ventures, which leads to the work on competencies. And as we're doing that, we start to think it's not just the venture that's emerging, it's the entrepreneur who's emerging as an entrepreneur. And as we started to look at that, we started to study how entrepreneurs experience the venture creation process, and that produced a book and a series of articles. And that experience is started by looking at some concepts of peak performance and peak experience and flow, and how that's different for low growth versus high growth entrepreneurs, which then culminated in the work on poverty where we started to realize, well, these low-income entrepreneurs create businesses that suffer from the commodity trap, 
low margin, low volume businesses that are undifferentiated, have no bargaining power with suppliers, buy at retail to sell at retail, and so forth, which led us to the work on the liabilities of poorness, which led us to the work on fear of success. What I'm trying to say, it's a flow. And that flow is totally inspired by the work we do on community engagement. It's core, it's central to the whole thing. And so, as Dante, when he's not writing about the fires of hell, says, art, as far as it is able, follows nature. As a pupil imitates his master, thus your art must be, as it were, God's grandchild. So, build community engagement as a core part of your career, and other things will manifest. Research will manifest. Teaching was if it's intentional. Thank you.